In the meantime, I'm going to go to my first guest of the afternoon, the son of a legendary film producer, Michael Klinger. I think you're going to remember him from possibly this movie. One day, a professional killer went home to visit his family and found his brother murdered. Now, who killed him? I don't know nothing. And listen. Michael Caine is Carter, a man with unbridled hate. Do you want to be dead? You knew what I'd do, didn't you, Elvis? Listen. Christ, I didn't kill him. <laughs> I know you didn't. When a professional killer hates, he turns animal. And there becomes but one law in the underworld jungle. Get Carter. Get Carter. Before Carter gets you. Love that, Get Carter. Before Carter gets you. And now my guest is Tony Klinger, who worked with his late father on the Northeast Institution. That is Get Carter. What a film. And now to celebrate over 50 years since hitting the big screen, he's putting together a documentary, Dirty, Sexy and Totally Iconic. Now, his dad's at Michael's route into cinema was a bit of an unusual one, as he came from the world of engineering. That's right, yeah. It, we, we regard it as the 50th anniversary plus COVID. But we'll accept 52 years. Um, yeah, my dad was an engineer and he came at it because, he, you know, you were drafted into your jobs during the Second World War. And he, he was stuck there, but it wouldn't let him out till a long time after the war. He built his way backwards into the industry, which he loved. He loved watching films, he didn't know anything about them. And so he started with a cinema, then more cinemas, and then distribution, and then found himself uh, to become a film producer and that, and that developed until he made the wonderful Get Carter in Newcastle. And, I mean, can you believe it? it's got such a cult following? Well, it's extraordinary. In fact, a, another person in the BBC, I won't name them, said to me, you know, because we made a film about it called Dirty, Sexy and Totally Iconic, which will be coming out later this year to celebrate the anniversary. And they said, everything's great about this, but, you know, it's such an old film now and it's more than 50 years and who will know about this film? And then we looked it up on uh, Google or somewhere, on, you know, the internet, and somebody told me, they said, you know, it's got 500 million mentions, Get Carter. Wow. And I went, oh, come on. I thought they must have got the number, you know, too many. <laughs> no, no, just extraordinary cult following all over the world to a ridiculous extent. And the interesting thing is, um, I read that you actually had the passion to produce films before your dad did. Isn't that right? When you were about nine, you were really interested. Actually, you're being unfair to me. It was eight. I was eight. <laughs> <laughs> OK, when you were eight. So, so what was going on? What was it you were wanting to do? They used to show... I mean, I'm talking in the dim distance. They used to show us uh, films from uh, Cadbury's and Nestle Chocolate. And uh, I think there was supposed to be 16 male films. And they used to show us those films, and then you're supposed to write an essay, what, what you learned, what you thought about the places they came from and all that. And I won one national competition, and I tied for another one with a girl that sat next to me and later became a journalist. And that was it, because the prize I got was pretty much as much chocolate as I could eat, and I could eat a lot. <laughs> And, and the other part of the prize was to go, in those days, which was not available generally, to go visit the chocolate factory. It was like the Willy Wonka ticket, you know, the golden ticket. So I got in my mind the idea, you see a film, you write something, you get chocolate. Well, what more does a kid want? That was, that was it. I just needed to find a way to do it. And so I started writing stuff and didn't know how scripts worked or anything like that before my father ever got involved with the film industry. So when he came into it, I kind of resented it because it was like where I was going. But we came at it from very different ends. He came at it from the business end. I came at it from the technical writing end, storytelling end. And you actually worked together on, on Get Carter, didn't you? Originally, the way I got involved was he, you know, he, they were looking for a location for the gangster's flat, if you remember this gangster's flat at the beginning yeah, of the film. Yeah, yeah. And I was, uh, well, myself and a friend were dating a couple of American girls in London. We were teenagers. And one of them said, do you want to come back to our flat? Well, we, we young boys, get invited to a girl's flat. Yes, you're there very quickly. And we went to the flat and 
I looked around and I said, wow, this is perfect for the film my dad's going to be making. She said, what do you mean? I said, well, we're looking for a flat. I said, don't get insulted, but it's actually supposed to be like a gangster flat. And this place is just, like, perfect. She said, well, you do know my uncle is a gangster. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's <laughs> amazing. <laughs> and it was, it was true. I won't say his name because he wants to have relatives about, but the flat was exactly like you see in the film. No dressing, no nothing. It was exactly like his flat was. <laughs> it was the perfect gangster flat. Yeah, because I was dying to know really about uh, what it is about, you know, kind of the northeast. Um, you know that, that people enjoyed filming here. Do you think it was like the budget, or do you think more the impression the north had on people back then? Oh, I think it was the latter. I think it wasn't nothing oh, to do with the budget. It. it was. It was literally the people. Were, uh, they still are. They were wonderful, interesting, fun people. The whole place was just different. It was, I think, a pivotal point in, in Britain was best exemplified by that film at that time in that place. It really was. You look at it, it's like a capsule of time. You look at the film, you look at the restoration of the film that's just currently been done by the BFI and Warner Brothers. It looks like, other than the costumes, it looks like it could have been made yesterday. It's so current and it's so... It's, it's a really interesting piece of cinema because maybe that's part of the reason it's a cult is young people can still watch it and still get something from it. Oh, I can 100% agree. It's always in everyone's like top 10 favourite films. So we're talking all about the film Get Carter. Can you believe 52 years old? Or like Tony said, 50 years plus COVID. We're going to be catching up more with him very shortly and talking about how proud his dad must have been. Uh, it's enduring success, which is just unbelievable, isn't it? Uh, like this afternoon, we've been hearing from Tony Klinger. He's the son of the late Michael Klinger, the producer behind the Northeast I iconic Get Carter. And now he's working currently on a documentary that celebrates its legendary status. It's called Dirty, Sexy and Totally Iconic and it's set to be released over the summer. Now, surely Tony's dad, Michael, would have been so proud of his endurance success, so I had to ask him about that. Well, he would have loved it. He would, he would have enjoyed that very much. When we started the making of the documentary about it, I was thinking about doing and COVID hit, you know, like everybody in the world. I was filming myself because I was thinking, like, should I do this? Shouldn't I do this? And then I thought, well, somebody's going to do this because it's the 50th anniversary at that time. And it should be me because I know more about it and it was my dad's film, etc. And I, I put on the first thing on uh, LinkedIn, I think it was, I, and Facebook maybe, I put on, does anybody remember the film? get Carter and did they like it kind of you know kind of an open question and during the night and we show we show what happened thousands of people thousands all put there was one negative out of I think the first six thousand one negative and the other 5,999 loved it and remembered it and wanted to know more about it and um, so that documentary you, you're on about working on that dirty sexy totally iconic um it's amazing because it's all about the making of Get Carter, isn't it? And I bet if you're a real big fan of the film, it's just so lovely being able to delve behind and find out just a little bit more about the story that we've all loved so much. Exactly right. Well, we, we feel that, you know, very much. And I thought I knew everything about it until I started making the film and I found out there were lots of things I didn't know and that were very interesting. It's the people surrounding it. And I'm very glad we did it when we did because... Unfortunately now, Mike Hodges, the film's director, who's a friend as well as a great film director, he passed a, a couple of months ago. It's great that we've got it on film. We've, got, we've, got, we've done it, we've got Britt Eklund. There's a nice interview with Michael Caine. And we go and delve into all the different people, different places, we go revisit them. It's, it's fascinating. It, it's my journey through my dad's mind and heart, I really. Yeah. It's, it, apart from being a love letter from me to my dad, it's also a real objective view of what that film meant. Oh, how lovely to have that. And one thing I want to know from you, Tony, is it true that um, when Michael Caine was chosen to play Carter, you actually thought he was wrong for the part? Is that true? Well, I admit that. <laughs> <laughs> I admit also that I was hugely wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but that's only, at least you put your hands up and say that. Uh, now, I mean, you have done so much over the years. I want to ask about some of your other work because you've had a phenomenal multi-award winning career. What are some of your highlights that you kind of look back and go, do you know what, I'm so proud of myself that I've done that? 
the one that everybody knows about, especially by vintage, was the film I made with The Who called The Kids Are All Right. It was a, a real experience working with a band like that for three years. Those memories you've got, you've worked with some absolutely incredible people. What is next for you then? What would you love to do next? You've done so much. Well, I've just written a script for an American film, uh, well, an American British film called, that's called Not in the Script. So it's a story about the sister of Sir Philip Green. It's about Elizabeth oh. Green. It's not about him, but obviously it does feature a bit, but it's about her life story, which is entirely fascinating. So I've just made a film called Sisters, which comes out on most of the platforms very soon, which is about the first and unfortunately last all-female orchestra in Kabul, Afghanistan. And we've got another one that we're editing now called Solo to Darwin, uh, which is the story of Amanda Harrison, who's a pilot when she was a kid. They told her she might make a supermarket checkout girl, and she ended up being a commercial jet pilot. Do you know, you don't stop, do you, at all? How do you, do you know when you get all these projects, how do you know what's right? Do you just get a, do you get a gut feeling? We do get offered a lot of things to do, and we have our own projects, obviously. So there's, there's a couple of ways it can happen. What, one, somebody could come along and torture me by waving huge amounts of money at me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the torture of having to work out a load of cash. <laughs> uh, that, that, that can get my attention. However, mostly it's people who we feel we've got an affinity to with a project that they're passionate about that we can share. Yeah. So we've got another one that we're just doing with a young man called Sammy Clifford or Samuel Clifford. It came about because he did the 20 minute piece on YouTube about Britney Spears and what happened to her. And it was brilliant and it got a couple of million views. And he came to me with a project called She's So Lucky. And what it's about is how we build up, particularly women, and we pick on Princess Di, Britney Spears, Whitney Houston, Amy Winehouse. And it's the story of how we build them up. We put them on a plateau in the sky then we destroy them, and then when they've been destroyed, we make them angels again. So much exciting work going on. Uh, I can't wait. You'll have to come on next time when you can give uh, more information on everything that you're up to, because I'm sure, like you said, I love when you've got certain projects that you can't tell us about. It seems very exciting. <laughs> uh, but for now, though, it's just amazing to speak with you and just celebrate, like, 10th of March, 2023, 52 years since the release of Get Carter. Now, when can we uh, expect to watch this documentary, Dirty, Sexy and Totally Iconic? Because it sounds wonderful well, for anyone who loves the film as much as I do. We've graded it, edited it, and we just got a couple of inserts to put in. And so it'll start being uh, ready to be released in the next quarter of the year. But we're going to, like we did with the 4K restoration of Get Carter, we're going to first show it in Newcastle. Oh, um, amazing. And we haven't told anybody that, so this is the first time we've said it, and, and we're going to make a thing of it, because that's what it should be. Oh, 100% that's what it should be. Well, thank you so much for the exclusive there. Uh, Tony Kalinga, who's got the documentary coming out all about Get Carter, dirty, sexy and totally iconic. And you heard him say himself, they're going to do a big celebration here in Newcastle when it does come out, so we will keep you posted. Because I'm sure a lot of people are going to want to be there, especially if it does like a Q&A and we get some more gossip about the film.